Okay. Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to my talk today. So um, as such, right, I named this event streaming and its potential for the gen AI world. But essentially, too, I want to introduce to you this open source um, library called Langstream. And then it's, as such, it is event streaming for gen AI type of application. But before I start, too, I should first ask, because this is a Java conference, and it's interesting. Everybody is associating machine learning, AI, like with non-Java kind of, you know, environment. But may I ask, first of all, how many of you, you know, I presumably you are most, most of you are working with Java, am I correct? And then also, too, then how many of you are already working with some form of AI or machine learning apps? How many have anybody working? Okay, so a, a few, not as many. But uh, may I ask then, are you working already with uh, Gen AI, generative AI uh, things too? Not, not yet. Okay, so like large language models, all of these, are, are these familiar with you at all? Yeah, some, somewhat. Okay, all right, so maybe I, that's what I thought, let me ask first, because I've done, this talk or some similar talk in which uh, even our founder of my company has done about talking about JVector is making use of uh, Java, the SIMD project Panama. Um, and uh, he has implemented this uh, very sophisticated vector library called it JVector open source, but then found out that there are a lot of folks afterwards said that we actually would like an introduction to vector database first. So that's why too I wanted to ask, and perhaps too I should also touch upon a bit too into vector database. And may I ask too maybe also how many of you have worked with or maybe heard first heard of vector database, vector data type? Okay, so maybe a few to very few. Okay, so that's good too. Maybe in that case, I'll also give a bit of a background too in this talk. And I understand it's only 45 minutes, so it's going to be a little bit tight, but I hope to kind of give you a sense or an introduction to vector database and, and then how like event streaming can kind of get into this whole picture. And I'm sure too, everybody is kind of familiar or, or or have heard of Gen AI, right? Chat GPT, all of these things. So that's what it is all about too. So I'll give a bit of an introduction and see how event streaming, which was something that I was talking more about and then with Apache Pulsar before. So how event streaming can be relevant for the Gen, uh, for the Gen AI world. So, okay, so thank you. Okay, so let me kind of quickly introduce myself. Um, okay, well, actually, let me give you an agenda. So I'm going to be changing this agenda a little bit, but it's essentially, too, I want to talk about LLMs, large language models, and some of the drawbacks, and then as to why event streaming can step in and help, you know, in this regard. But f of course, too, now I have to squeeze in. Basically, after this, I'll start with something with LLMs and NLP, all of these things with artificial intelligence, and then before I get into all of these, you know, drawbacks of LLMs and different options for improvement, and then the, the REC, which is a pattern. Um, essentially, event streaming can help with implementing this pattern, too. Um, and then also then Langstream, which is what I will also be talking about, too. So, okay. And uh, let me go. Uh, why is this not working? <laughs> okay. Maybe I would use the arrow. Okay, so first of all, who is Mary? Just a quick introduction. Um, I, I think I recognize some of you too, and some of you actually recognize me, so thank you if you are in the audience. So yeah, so my name is um, Mary Grigleski, uh, over here. Yeah, so I'm a Java champion, and also a leader of the Chicago Java Users Group too. Um, but interestingly, so I'm, by day, I'm a developer advocate, currently at Data, Data Stacks. Datastax is a company that um, prim primarily is it's famous for its Apache Cassandra implementation, and we have our cloud uh, platform too. And may I ask too, how many of you are working with Cassandra maybe? Maybe like a few too. Okay, so it's a NoSQL database. So that's what my company is primarily famous for. And we continue to do so, and now also adding in vector data type to support like generative AI type of applications. Um, so, uh, um, and so for me though, I'm actually, I got hired last year, a year and a half ago and then doing like event streaming because they wanted to add streaming into the whole picture. And then 
like about four months ago, the company decided to also follow this Gen AI path. And then now we have a vector database, and that's what it is. And then also now we also have a Langstream, which is an event streaming library for Gen AI type of application. But anyway, so that's about me. And then these are all the things I've been working with. But as such, too, I'm actually focusing more on AI now for Gen AI because the company's, that's the company's direction, and that's what I'm working on. So. Okay, so that's that, and let me go here. So, okay, so rather than kind of going into drawbacks of, of this, actually, why don't I do this? Because I also have another talk, and that, that might actually make sense too. I'll, I'll actually um, uh, start, with, start with another um, talk, kind of, kind of interesting, <laughs> and kind of changing, because I think it would, it would make sense that I kind of talk a bit more. I, I just draw some, draw some um, information from here. So maybe real quick too, like a brief background about you know AI first of all, because even I'm kind of new to to AI to like more AI like generative AI. So I wanted to understand a bit more about AI. But essentially too, if you if we think of artificial intelligence, it's actually started as early as 400 and 500 BC. If you kind of think of you know there there was an invention by a Greek philosopher called Archytas. Arch Architects, and he invented the steam-powered pigeon. So it's kind of steam-powered, but mechanical. But the idea is that AI is essentially will help us in terms of you know taking away some of the the, the burdens of us having to do some sort of re repetitive type of job. You know, kind of uh, heavily, kind of in computers too. It will be taking you know kind of a lot of the kind of tedious type of computing work out, out from us. So, so this is, uh, but this, I won't get into all the details of all of the, um, you know, uh, AI stuff, but it's basically all about automation that we're dealing with. But first of all, to also understand a bit too about AI, this whole picture, as, you, as we all know, we hear about AI all the time. That's more of an over-encompassing term. And if you, this is kind of a famous kind of Venn diagram, so to speak, right? It describes artificial intelligence. It mimics, right, the intelligence and behavior pattern of human beings. And so that's what kind of makes it different than other kind of um, typical like computing activities. And the thing is that then there's a subset of it, which is machine learning. And machine learning is essentially is allowing the computer to learn, you know, from data without you actually explicitly giving any rules to it. So you let the, the programs to learn, you know, for, uh, base, based on the data itself. And then a, a bit live even further deeper into it will be with the deep learning side. So that kind of deals with the techniques, right? So you have he probably heard of like neural networks. And those are kind of really mimicking how our neurons work and, and getting into that kind of area. So we won't get into all of that today, but also wanting to mention is that for Gen AI is basically a com combination of machine learning and also like deep learning kind of techniques into there. So high level wise, that's what it is. So let's kind of quickly then take, into, take a look into generative AI. So it is a more of a disruptive field in AI. So why is it different, right? It's because it changed the way how we uh, create the content and also consume it. And as such, too, is is about generate. That's why it's generative because we're kind of taking, making use of this generative type of technology um, from you know, kind of like based on data, it generates all of the responses. And the thing is, too, with this Gen AI um, kind of approach is that is dealing with prompts. So you, the the thing is that in order to be able for it to generate responses, that you need to give it input, right? So that's what the prompts are. And you probably, some of you are working with like prompt engineering. So essentially too, you have to give it the question. So then this large lang language model be able to kind of figure out all of the answers for you in there. So the difference is that with Gen AI and then versus previously, which we've been doing more in the AI would be like predictive AI. Predictive AI, if you think about it, it, it deals more with like as such as prediction. So dealing with something that's a bit time kind of uh, constrained because we're talking about business forecasts or weather forecasts. You're looking at some data and then you make some prediction. Whereas generative AI tends to deal with more creative kind of data. We know that you know, now it can help us to write an essay, um, write a report, and uh, compose music and that, that type of stuff. So it's a bit on the creative side. So that's like generative AI. And it is disruptive is because not only that, like it takes input, 
the input doesn't have to be conforming to any kind of computer way of talking. It's not like programming. You, you assign variables in quite rigid way. It's basically dealing with human beings talking. You're talking to the machines like you're talking to another person. So that's what is kind of disruptive and also being able for it to be able to sense more than just kind of word for word. It's dealing with the context and building up, like, you know, sensing how you feel. And that's what is kind of making it more disruptive. Okay. So, okay, so these are just some kind of history. I won't get into it. But let's kind of take a look at GPT, right? So chat GPT is the kind of the thing. It essentially stands for generative pre-trained transformer. So it's essentially, too, is the transformer model. That's what we're kind of going after from, you know, from a developer kind of point of view. So it takes, like, simple prompts, like, again, like natural human language as input, and then it does what is called search. The search is actually vector similarity search, um, especially when we're kind of working with vector database, and which is something that my company is is doing now with our implementation of Cassandra too. And uh, essentially, you answer questions for the prompts, and then it produces like a blog article or, or write, you know, a, a computer program, you know, a write music and like that too. So that's kind of uh, GPT technology. Um, but just wanted to kind of point out, it's actually quite new because only five years ago or so, OpenAI started, they published this paper on GPT by Alec Radford of this uh, language model. It's only 2018, and since then it started, the GPT kind of movement essentially started, right? So 2019 already came out with GPT-2, and uh, kind of like uh, essentially too, the data set is getting larger and larger too. And so now, kind of like in 2022, like just last year, it came out with kind of text to image. So you basically can ask, right, and describe to me, or, or kind of paint a picture of somebody doing something, and it will generate that image for you. So it is quite uh, disruptive, too. And then in 2013, like if we go into current year, as we can see, once um, the, the chat GPT 3.5 that came out in November of 2022, so just barely a year ago, so 11 months ago, when that came out, it basically took the world by storm. And as we know, within five days, it's already got like a, a billion download or something of, of this chat GPT 3.5. And of course, it's getting better and better too. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's the thing. So then, then, let's then take a look at natural language uh, processing too. So what it is, right? It's basically a interdisciplinary studies between linguistics and computer, computer science too. So again, you know, we're talking about languages. So it, get, it does require this study to, to kind of get into linguistics to study languages. And it's basically also dealing with large um, corpora of data, right? The text um, kind of a speech type of uh, data, data set that it needs to be processing. And then it used some rule-based or probabilistic machine learning approaches to it too. So it enables, this NLP will enable your computer program to learn from this content itself, including the contextual kind of meaning too of these um, kind of data with it too. And then it can draw insights from these documents too, not just kind of, you know, A plus A equals B or something like that. It kind of goes beyond just that. So that's the thing. And so now it gets into large language models. And I'm sure too, if you're developers, you're starting to work with Gen AI, then you're working with LLMs. Everybody's talking about large language models these days. So what it is, is a machine learning model. It's, it's what is called like foundation um, model, right? So foundation in a sense is that you and I, we would, you know, like common people, so to speak, we won't be training the data because it's just simply not possible. We're dealing with huge data sets and you need a lot of um, GPUs to process it too. And not only that, even with tons of GPUs, it's going to take days, if not weeks or months to process it too. So normally too, right? For example, chat GPT is a large language LLMs, and then there are different implementations and by different companies, vendors, like Microsoft has been built into that chat GPT or um, Google has BARD, for example. So these are kind of foundation model. But then the problem with that is that, as you can see, right? It, 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 you know, you train the model, but the data is maybe taken from a certain period of time. Normally, like you say, 2022 data. Then what happened now between 2022 and now? So there's a gap in there. So that's where we're kind of experimenting with using event streaming 
to be able for you to you know, prompt you know, your LLMs. And you prompt it, and there are data that's missing, and you use event streaming to be implementing the data that's missing to kind of help with you know, kind of augmenting your LLMs, essentially. So that, that's what it is. So. OK, so and, and then without going to details, but just giving examples, you might have, you know, folks you might have heard of, like Langchain. These are popular. Langchain and Llama 2 or JLlama. Or th there's actually also Java implementation, too. Palm, and it's for more Google, Vertex, AI. Hugging Face, and all of these are kind of popular API that, uh, frameworks that we use for Gen AI. But because this is a Java conference, so it it's kind of makes sense to talk about some of the Java libraries if you're ever kind of looking into it. There's uh, also at our company, we have uh, folks actually working on this library. It's Llama. As such, Llama comes from Facebook or Meta. So Llama 2, but um, we also have uh, parts of Llama 2 uh, using Java too. So that's JLlama. It's done by our company. It's all open source. And also to our founder of the company, um, Jonathan Ellis too, he designed this uh, JVector. These are like vector supporting vector query searches are really, really super fast, too. So that's called JVector, and I won't have time to get into that. But if you're interested, too, please take a look, too. These are like the different GitHub links. And, and then there's also Langchain, also has a Langchain 4J, which is the Java port. But it's not directly related to Langchain. It's somebody who is interested, and they, they port it to Java. And then Llama 2, and also Llama 2 is essentially a direct port of Llama uh, C, like that, that one, too. So. So there, so some some of the things. So no, now then, let me kind of introduce you a bit too about vector database and why is it important, right? Um, because too, if you kind of think of it, traditional data database, right? If you, you can still like use traditional SQL database or kind of um, you know relational database to do generative AI type of um, application. However, you know now we are talking about we want to, you know we we want to store information that's actually more than just you know kind of kind of, so to speak, like pure data. We're dealing with data that's multidimensional be because we want to be able to study and find out relationship of this data with, you know, that you, we want to be able to kind of do search and build out some context. So as such is that there, there's this new data type called vector data, data type. And if you are kind of a math person, you, are, you work with linear algebra, you're familiar with vector. So it's kind of similar in, in, in a sense. So what it is is that, when you kind of read the data, right, large sets of data you come in, what you do is you actually, let's say some strings, you need to store it. You actually parse your string, and then with each, str is each word that's from there, then it, con it gets converted to vector embeddings. These are numerical representations of your string. So essentially, too, if you kind of look into a vector database, what you do is that you find that there are arrays of floating point integers in, in your data. So that's kind of represent your, your search strings, your prompt strings. So that's what it is, vector database, is that it, it, say, for example, our Cassandra implementation has actually this support of this vector database. The, the reason is that you want your data to be multidimensional because now you are like searching based on context, not just based on, you know, kind of like, uh, I want to search for A equals 2.5 or something. This is about you're searching for something that's related to it. So then as such too, it has this, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, techniques or algorithms that we use is called approximate nearest neighbor. This this particular. There are also other uh, algorithms too, but the ANN is actually the more efficient type of model. And then there's there's also just wanted to point out to you, for example, like Elasticsearch, right? They are using HN, HNSW, that particular search too. So there's kind of like <coughs> differences to it too. But as such too, ANN. <coughs> allows you to do searches and then essentially too when you are doing searches is basically you want to say I want to you know as such we're now dealing dealing with vector vector data types so these are like arrays of um, floating point um, numbers right in in your searches so when you search for it you want to search for how close you are you know with with the search string to what you have stored up like that so then you want to maybe search and say I want to be 0 0.9 closest to what is being able to come back in the result set. And then you narrow down your result set like that. So that's what kind of in a nutshell, that's what like vector database is and how it deals with the vector data type too. So, okay, so 
So this kind of gets into some of the mechanism too. So I just wanted to really quickly kind of say what is vector and embedding. So it transforms it, the text into a vector called an embedding. So it can be, the embedding can be many dimensions too. Uh, for example, OpenAI currently embeddings are 1536 dimensions, right? And so like, for example, here you can tell too, like these are two dimensional, two dimensions like normalized vectors. So you can have different version of it and as such is that, you know, it, it deals with all of the, the math that's kind of behind the scenes. And you can kind of, kind of take a look into, in, into this. It's, it's kind of a mathematical formula to kind of determine how it is, right? So in other words, data is now more complex. We're not dealing with scalar type of data. data. Now we're dealing with vector um, data type. So. Okay, so here is just an example. For example, it captures the essence of a word or a block of text, right, within the context too. So the, the dimensions, it, essentially, it came out is because of the LLM, the pre-training, um, that's kind of result of that. So you can see too, if you represent that in vector space, that's what it looks like, the different um, kind of representation of your data in this case. Okay, so here too, it's just like, um, this I won't get into all of the details, but essentially if you're interested, right, um, there are like embedding storage. And, and why we want to do that is that because it's, it's, more, um, it's more efficient or in, in this case, right? Because again, I kind of explained to you, you have algorithms. It allows you to do fast retrieval. So the, the, the techniques we're using, right? It, it does like ANN type of uh, nearest neighbor type of algorithms, but otherwise too, HNSW was also used before, but we decided that, you know, we have kind of studies, actually our founder, Jonathan, he was saying the ANN is actually more efficient to it because as such, doing that kind of search, it matters what kind of storage you have and also what kind of query you have. So the, uh, the ANN is actually also support this uh, is, um, uh, kind of storage technique called disk N, so disk ANN too. So that one is allows you to do searches and from your storage and how it is, you know, without knowing all the details, because there will be another few lectures to kind of describe it, but it just allows a you know, very efficient type of searches and query from that kind of uh, storage too. So, okay, so it's kind of essentially vectors are new type of data supported in established database. For example, our data stacks, we have Astra data, DB, Cassandra very soon will also have this vector database. And then there are other specialized databases you might, which you may be working with is like Pinecone or Weaviate and Milpheus. Tho those are also like vector database too. Okay, so that's a kind of um, really quickly kind of explain to then there, we're dealing with vector embeddings. It's not just for similarity searches. If you kind of think of you searching for data that builds up a context, it can be actually helping you to do clustering, to do recommendations, because as you know, if we do shopping experience, right, we want to kind of based on somebody's shopping pattern, you want to make recommendations. So those we kind of a good use cases. Anomaly detection, right? You can kind of also see if there are sometimes there are anomaly in your data, you can use that to kind of detect any kind of anomaly. And diversity measurement and classification of all of your text too. So those are kind of have multi multiple usages for, for vector embeddings. So just kind of point out then, you know, going back to, you can still use traditional database, but the thing is that it's not built to handle these multi-dimensional data in traditional data sets, right? Because now we're dealing with data that has needs to have multiple dimensions, the patterns of the relationships, you need to kind of uh, handle that. And you can use traditional database, but probably will take you much longer because you have to go through many iterations to figure out from your data what, you know, you want to try to do searches. How do you kind of search for it? So, so essentially, you still can use it, but it's kind of much slower is what it is. Okay, so this one too, just wanted to um, kind of point out to you, kind of goes back to more of the streaming side of things. So we just want to kind of describe it, right? So there's also a technique called retrieval augmented uh, gener generation. So actually, let me kind of switch back, <laughs> switch back to my other um, uh, kind of uh, slides now, going back, back to this one. <laughs> sorry, if I knew it, I would have done this. Uh, and so, okay, sorry. Let me kind of go. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, let, or maybe let me kind of, before I get into the regs too, let me kind of, now we have a bit of an introduction to LLMs, but let's kind of take a look at LLMs, you know, and as I mentioned a little bit already is that, you know, LLMs are pre-trained model. They train on some data set that tends to be older than what your current 
data up to. But the data keeps changing, so you need to account for the real-time kind of aspect of your data. So if you kind of look into AI, right, this is kind of a diagram that describes, you know, you need to do, well, for traditional machine learning, you, you essentially has two kind of broad phases of doing machine learning. One is kind of the tradition, you know, the, the training phase, right? You're doing pre-train, you need to train your data, and then use ML engineering, all of these, and generate your model. And that's what it is, right? Like, kind of look at it like chat GPT as an example. And then basically, to once you have your model, then you do inference. Inference is when you use the data to kind of look up for, for you know, when you do searches based on the prompts, you know, all of these things, and doing similarity searches. So then here, this is the live data is what is missing in the current LLM model. And then you, but we want to be able to bring in live data, so we're using um, event streaming techniques and apply to the model, and then you can generate the results. So that's kind of like the goal of what we're trying to do here. Okay, so um, here, um, this one I think is, is this we already, already kind of talked about. So essentially, this kind of another kind of similar diagram is that we're kind of dealing with large language model, the GPT, and um, as of September 2021 in here, you get your public internet text, and then you apply like ML engineering to train it, all of these, um, and then you generate an LLM. And then here, the prompts, you know, the prompts too can also drive, you know, kind of like the, the real-time data to drive it into it, but you're making use of a technique which is called retrieval augmented um, generation. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. Okay. Again, you know, LLMs can't memorize all of the knowledge in their parameters. And also, uh, LLMs are probabilistic, right, and um, like that. And then also, LLMs, is they are opaque, right? It's not possible to interpret or explain or add attribution to the answers, too. So kind of LLMs are useful, but there is, these are some of the kind of shortcomings to it, too. So, um, so we want to be able to, for example, add attributions to some of your data in there. So how can we do it, right? Training, of course, training LLMs are also very expensive, right? And we know makes use, it needs so much um, GPUs, everything. So, so these are options for different um, improvement, too, if you kind of think about LLMs. And, you know, if let's say if you're not using a REC approach, and you, what you can do is you can create your own foundation model, but then as such, we already talked about it's not po possible because it's dealing with such huge amounts of data, it, it needs so much GPUs. I think ordinary people, we're not going to be able to afford all the GPUs. So that's out of the question. And then you can also do in machine learning what is called fine-tuning too. So fine-tuning is that you can still retain that same set of languages, but it's such, as such too, you are doing fine-tuning. So you kind of narrow down your, your search set to on any kind of new data uh, like that. And then there's also then the prompt engineering side, and you can basically use uh, prompts, and you can tweak your prompt, prompts to kind of co cox your output, to kind of force your output too. But as such, with prompt engineering, it runs into the same problem, is that your LLMs already has that set of data, then how do you deal with new data that comes in? So, okay, so, so all of this is kind of, um, I already talked about it, right? Prompting is basically Gen AI is just about building a prompt, but there's uh, restrictions in, in prompts too. Its size of prompts is limited. So, okay, and this one too, just wanting to analyze a little bit too about a prompt. So the problem to solve, for example, we, we're kind of dealing with a prompt is we normally will be asking some questions, right? Should we propose a reduction uh, coupon to the user, for example? And then from there is that there is dynamic data that we, we're going to have to aggregate structured data from multiple sources in real time. Like event-driven architecture can kind of help in this sense. And then there's a, now then we can kind of in, kind of add in the rack. It's basically it is the data that will solve the problem that wasn't scraped you know, during the training, right? So we're adding in additional data to the LLMs in this case. So this is kind of uh, analyzing this prompt. And uh, okay, so this kind of also kind of explained to OpenAI again. You know, GPT 3.5 Turbo has 4,097 tokens. But for, for OpenAI's, uh, the Turbo 16K, then it has like 16,385 tokens. But still, it's still not enough, right, to cover all of the real-time missing data in there. So, so basically, the problem domain, the basically domain-specific data is huge, right? It doesn't fit into LLM prompt. So now, th there we introduce the RAG pattern, retrieval, augmentation, 
generation. So what is RAG, right? So RAG essentially is a hybrid framework that integrates retrieval models and also the generative models too. So the, pro the purpose is to produce text, right? That is not only contextual, contextually accurate, but we also want to have kind of rich data that comes out from it too. So if you kind of look at it, this two model for the RAG is that the retrieval is sort of like librarian. It's pulling in relevant data from many sources, maybe from a database or for, from the large corpus of documents too. And then we feed this data into the generative model. The generative model will be like writing and crafting out all the contents, um, you know, based on your prompts too. And that then that's what it is. So, so these if you combine these two and make them work in tandem, then you will pro provide answers, right? That hopefully is not only accurate too, but also like contextually rich. And as you may be also aware is that, you know, in, in like LLMs or Gen AI, there's a huge problem with hallucinations you may have heard of. And that's basically, it's generating, you know, sometimes if you ask the model, some questions that it doesn't already have it stored, it, it, it may be doing the wrong thing. Instead of telling you that, oh, I don't know the answer, it actually answer you something wrong. And I can give you some example too. I was like earlier, maybe five months ago, I had to do a presentation and for a Japanese meetup group. And then I was actually doing Pulsar. And then they said, well, can you kind of translate it into Japanese? So I had to do a pre-recording, so I used Zoom. And Zoom actually has captioning for doing different language sets, right? So I said, okay, let me do Japanese. So while I was recording, it immediately generates all of the Japanese translation. But of course, I did, don't know Japanese, so I did not know if it was right or wrong. But I was just trusting, okay, maybe Zoom is doing its job. So after I did the recording, I passed it on to my Japanese uh, colleague, and I for my company, he was responsible for communicating with the meetup group. And so he was like listening to it. He said, that was totally wrong, all, your, all you have uh, recorded. And so what happened, I, th I think it is very true because I was trying to do the the, the, you know, to, to do my presentation, but the LLMs in there, right, doesn't already have knowledge that's technical, technically specific to Pulsar. So rather than kind of coming out and said, I cannot translate, it actually randomly picks some things, some words, maybe it's not doing it right for the, for the approximate kind of thing. So it came out all wrong. So my Japanese colleague was like laughing, was saying, oh, this comes out, it's all wrong. Like what you're talking, it's just, doesn't make any sense. So, so as such, you know, that's kind of an example of a hallucination. So, so that's the thing is that we want, you know, we, we don't want our LLMs to be to be like generating wrong thing. And if, if you don't know something, just say I don't know rather than wrong thing. So that's kind of a big problem too currently in, you know, the current chat GPT. But I think there are already many techniques as trying to reduce hallucinations too. So, so that's kind of an example. So we can make use of this RAG model that is what we, what it is. So Okay, so again, two foundational elements of RAG, retrieval model and also the generative model. So let's kind of, uh, I think the retrieval model I already kind of explained to already. But basically, too, we're kind of dealing with um, data that can be kind of, um, you know, kind of feed into your, your database, right? So then we're making use of vector database. So, and essentially, that's what my company now is that we have vector database, but we also have a group that's working on this open source and lang stream uh, that is essentially helping with uh, streaming data in all of these things and also working with our, our, our vector embeddings. And also, as you stream data in, you want to kind of write the data to your database too. So, so kind of we're kind of leveraging on different models of writing the data, converting it to embeddings as well. So this one I already explained right, about vectors and, and, and essentially too, it deals with multiple dimensions as well. So I won't get into all the details, won't repeat it again. And this is again an example. It captures the essence of a word, right, or a block of text within this context and the dimensions, basically the result of the LLM training. Okay, and then vector store as as such too. I will just kind of quickly maybe share with you the link to uh, J Vector in a little bit too. But um, but I already kind of talk about it. But now let's take a look into the generative model side. So row row of this. Uh, generative model, right? So if you kind of, like earlier, we talked about retrieval is pulling in all of the data. So generative, obviously, is pulling all the data in and then you write the data out. So it's kind of act as like creative writers and it synthesizes this retrieved information into contents and generate, you know, and, and put you into the right context and producing results that are contextually rich. 
Um, and it's built upon LLMs, right? And, and basically it has the capability to create text that is grammatically correct and semantic, semantic, semantically meaningful and aligned with the initial query or the prompt to. So basically it takes the raw data that's selected by the retrieval model and give, give it a more narrative kind of structure is the generative model. And making your information kind of, you know, more easy to digest and you, you can then kind of apply action to it too. So it's essentially in the REC framework too, there are retrieval and generative. Generative models basically it gives you the final piece, right, of, of this puzzle and gives you the results that's kind of more rich, right, and kind of gives you the context um, that you can interact, you know, with the output. Okay, so now then let's kind of introduce to you Langstream. So Langstream as such too, um, uh, you know, it, like it, again, it's open source library. So it it actually enables you to stream data in, and currently it works with uh, Apache Pulsar and Apache Kafka too. And then also too, as such, right, and, and it also interacts with LLMs, for example, over here is OpenAI, uh, Vertex AI, and also like Hugging Face and all of these uh, LLMs too. And it works with vector stores, not just with our Cassandra or um, Astra, Astra, which is again the DataStax uh, Cassandra implementation on the cloud, and also Pinecone and Milfits, for example. And then it has also connectors that allows you to connect to different da like relational databases, like the traditional one, like Postgres and My MySQL, Redis, and Kafka Connect, Mongo, all of these. And then also it works with library like Langchain, Llama Index, and Apache Tika and Python as well. So this is kind of gives you an uh, kind of a, an example of this. And there will be more connectors being built too. Okay. So here too, as such too, it, it also works on, works with like Kubernetes and also work with the hyperscalers like AWS and Azure, Microsoft and GCP as well. So I uh, just wanted to point out to you. So as such too, if you kind of, kind of take a look into it, like event streaming, we're talking about building data pipelines too. So the idea will be kind of similar to like traditional like event streaming type of uh, kind of architecture. You have source and then basically sources can be in Kafka, as I kind of mentioned earlier, works with Kafka, Pulsar, Python, even web crawler, S3, all of these can be sourced. And then essentially too, then it, it goes through your data, kind of goes through some pipeline, and then all of these pipeline um, uh, processor, right? So it deals with Python custom and compute embeddings, all of these that are kind of listed in here. You can kind of normalize the text and detect language, doing all of the processing that it needs. And then with the results, it will then output it to a sync. So it kind of works like the kind of traditional, again, like data pipeline source kind of going through transformation and then output to a sync like that. So all done within like the same part too, like when we kind of put this into Kubernetes uh, context too. Okay, so so the thing with uh, Langstream is that it's also, uh, it's kind of, we aim at kind of low code, meaning that you don't have to write as much code because it can, does, it can do all of the code behind the scenes. And then you can basically make use of YAML files and describe, you know, like for example, these are, it works kind of like you know, traditional message broker, you can describe what kind of topic, input topic or output topic it, it needs to be working with and the pipeline, all of these things in here. So it's essentially two example application will be like read, the, read from some input topic and then ask the, a, the open API for chat completion, all of these, and then it writes all of these streamed answer chunks to output topic for you. So that's kind of like this event streaming kind of way of helping you to kind of stream in, you know, the real time data that, that uh, kind of more up to date for you. So, okay. so. This is kind of an example of a, a rag chat bot in here, but I think I see that we, uh, and let me kind of get into this diagram. I think that's where I kind of, uh, kind of ended at, at, at my previous set of slides. And so it comes into here. So as you can see, right, the rag can kind of be there to help with filling in all of the gaps. And as such, right, there's a LL, this is kind of representing like a typical kind of chat GPT kind of data flow. You have user input that comes in with the prompt and then it goes through the embedding services and, and kind of augmented you know, with, with all of the vector data and the embeddings from the vector database. And essentially, too, from there, the inferencing will come and essentially, you know, kind of read from your database and get all of these responses and write them out to the response data, too. So, yeah, so kind of not like too, you know, kind of like to uh, what you call like earth shattering is kind of a typical type of flow in here. 
Okay, and here um, I have resources, but then I, I actually have actually the quick demo too. Uh, would you have time? I can just quickly show it to you too. Okay, all right. So um, actually over here, oops, sorry. Let me, uh, it's too many things. Okay, sorry. Okay, let me, let me quick start. Okay, so as such, I was like sharing with you um, Langstream. So you can go to langstream.io uh, or AI or some, yeah. And anyway, I have it listed there. So, so basically, too, this one is, is kind of a real, real quick start to how do you get started with Langstream. And you can go to a quick start and install this Langstream, but you want to also make sure you have Java, Docker, and also, of course, install this Langstream. But I've already installed it. So you just, if it's on a Mac, then you do brew install install your Langstream, and then make sure you have your OpenAI access key set, right? And, and that's what it is. And then over, over here, too, you can quickly kind of run this command. It's Langstream Docker run test. And so make sure you have, uh, have um, your, your Docker running, too. So over here, too, if, when you run this, too, so this is a, just a very quick example. It runs it. And let me kind of quickly show it to you here. So. So like I said, I already installed Langstream, and then I've set up my open um, AI key. And then over here, um, let me, I guess I, I could make it a little bit higher. Make it a little higher so you can see it better. So it's basically running this Langstream Docker run test, um, and then again, making use of all the YAML files. So this is just an example of a uh, chatbot, a very basic chatbot, too. That's what uh, it is. So it, it's starting all the broker, all of the processes that are needed in here. Um, OK, that's fine. OK. OK, and then once this is up, then we can kind of chat, essentially ask questions, and then you can see the responses, too. So OK, so this is going to take a bit of time. And let me, let me see. Can you see okay? It's always a challenge trying to do two dem demos in, in a small screen. Yeah. It's still going. Yeah. Okay. But but I do have to say, though, somehow it is actually not too fast at this point. <laughs> we can kind of fine tune it, too, but at least give you some idea, too. So, OK. So, OK. Um, OK, so now it is up. So again, you can try this. Oops. I can't, I can't make it bigger somehow. OK, so this is our Langstream, this example. Why is it actually lately my system has been acting up? <laughs> so okay, so as you can see, this is running is ready to take input. So I can just do a connect in here. And is everything running localhost? And over here, let's say what what should we ask? We'll just say um, maybe uh, what is the capital uh, uh, city of Poland? And let's see. So now it's kind of going and, and kind of uh, uh, you know running and see. But like I said, I was like, oh, actually, it's, it's quite fast this time. So the capital city of Poland is Warsaw. So it answers it correctly. So I'd like to invite you, because I also kind of uh, right now is running short on time. But I'd like to invite you to try out Langstream if you are interested into trying out you know, event streaming for your Gen AI apps. And also, to use our um, Astra database. And we are g giving out like $25 US dollar per month uh, for you to try out. It's very sufficient if you're doing some basic uh, kind of operations, too. So I'll share the link with you shortly. But as such, too, you can bring this Langstream up and try this out yourself. It has, it's in the quick start uh, section, too. So OK, so let me kind of go back to my resources, and I'll share with you. So this slide deck, um, again, you know, I have the missing piece. Um, I'll try to add in the piece of the LLMs back in there that I talked about earlier. But otherwise, too, you please uh, connect uh, here, and you'll be able to get to my slides. And again, I'll add in the LLMs and the, the NL NLP stuff for you. Yeah, OK. I think folks are still taking picture. <laughs> OK, so even if you miss, don't worry about it. I'm going to share this with the organizers here. Oh, 
Okay, and then this is like the, the set of resources. I talk about Langstream and then also the Langstream uh, GitHub page and also our vector search um, also on Cassandra and astra.datastacks.com is where you can uh, sign up for our, our free, free tier um, Astra database access to. And then also the J vector, which I don't have as much time to talk about. If you are kind of interested into internals of how the vector um, disk and all of these things are working, J vector is the one that our founder has actually implemented too. So I'll be doing more talks on it later too. So, okay. And then this actually, if you know you are interested, again, this also is another link that you can click on to get to our Astra uh, database platform. And then you can try out, uh, use our vector database and give it a try. And then you can then take a look and, you know, and, and I don't have time now, but otherwise I can show you how we can create a database with the vector data type too. So, but uh, if you're interested, I can talk about it out in the hallway too. So, okay. And then I also have a Twitch stream if you're interested in following me. But if you, once you have my um, slides and you can, you can actually um, find, find out all of this information. And here, too, is just the JDD conference asks um, er, you, if you like, you please rate my lecture. Um, and uh, so thank you ahead of time. And thank you very much again for um, staying here and listening to my talk. I hope it's helpful. It's just a lot of information. I might have jumped from here and there. But please feel free to give me feedback. And thank you so much again. So, yeah. <laughs>